Good afternoon. I'm going to go ahead and get started. My name is Mon Sharma, the president of the Morris Federal Society. Um, on behalf of the Morris Federal Society and the IP Law Society here at Morris, I want to welcome you to today's event titled, Is Intellectual Property Even Relevant Anymore? Uh, we're proud to have the John Templeton Foundation sponsoring us for this event. They've got the uh, excellent catered food we hope you're enjoying. Um, I want to mention just a few things before we get going. The first is that elections for the Morris Federal Society are coming up at the end of this month. There'll be an email out on the TWIN listserv, so if you're on TWIN and you're on our site, you'll be able to get the updates for that, the voting, and uh, if you want to run, that sort of thing. Next, I'll explain the format, and then I'll get started with the brief introduction of speakers, and we'll get going here. Uh, first, the format, as usual, is going to allow for a debate, so we're going to have uh, 12 minute introductions by each speaker, starting with our guest speaker, which is Stefan Kinsella. And then we'll have a 10 minute rebuttal in the same order. Finally, we'll have a question and answer session uh, with you, the members of the audience. So, I'll start with uh, Professor Grant. Professor Stephen Grant practices with the Stanley Law Group in Dublin in the field of intellectual property. His most particular expertise is the prosecution of U.S. patent applications that originated in foreign patent offices. He's been admitted to practice for more than 20 years in the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, the Supreme Court of Ohio, the Northern Ohio Federal District Court, and the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals. He's been a frequent speaker at continuing legal education courses, uh, as well as at general education presentations for inventors, writers, and artists. He's a regular contributor to the newsletter of the Ohio State Bar Association Intellectual Property Law Section. He's taught a number of law schools around the country, including here at Morris, and he's noted for his teaching ability. And Stefan Kinzella is a registered patent attorney and general counsel for Applied Optoelectronics Incorporated. He's a former partner with Dwayne Morris. He's prosecuted hundreds of patent applications for high-tech clients, including Intel, GE, and others. He's a senior fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute, editor of Libertarian Papers, and director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. He's published numerous articles and books on IP law, international law, and application of libertarian principles to legal topics, including international investment, political risk, and dispute resolution of practitioners guide, Louisiana Civil Law Dictionary, and Against Intellectual Property, published by the Institute in 2008. He's a former adjunct law professor at South Texas College of Law, and he currently teaches at the Online Wizards Academy on Intellectual Property and Libertarian Legal Theory. With that, please join me in welcoming first, Stefan Gonzalez. good to be here. Thank you, Amon. Um, I'm going to start out uh, with some sort of Austrian economics type observations. Human beings in this world are largely dissatisfied creatures. This is why we act. Humans employ means that are causally efficacious at changing the state of affairs that would otherwise occur so as to achieve ends they have to ameliorate their felt uneasiness. This is a Misesian idea. These means, which in our bodies are necessarily scarce or rivalrous, this means that there's the possibility of violent conflict when two people struggle over a given scarce resource. As the Austrian uh, libertarian philosopher and economist Hans Hermann Hoppe says, only because scarcity exists is there even a problem of formulating moral laws. Insofar as goods are superabundant or free goods, no conflict over the use of goods is possible and no action coordination is needed. Hence, it follows that any ethic correctly conceived must be formulated as a theory of property, i.e. a theory of the assignment of rights of exclusive control over scarce means, because only then does it become possible to avoid otherwise inescapable and irre irre irresolvable conflict. So in other words, what libertarians favor is peace, cooperation, and prosperity, and therefore we favor the assignment of property rights so that resources that are scarce can be used peacefully and productively and cooperatively. And in particular, what we favor is the assignment of property rights as follows. Each person 
owns his own body. And he also owns resources that he homesteads or that he acquires by contract from a previous owner. This is exactly why a growing number of libertarians, including myself, oppose patent and copyright. We view the grant of such artificial rights by the state as statist, socialist, and theft. This is because these rights grant to third parties, say inventors, artists, and creators, a veto right over how owners use their own property. In effect, patent and copyright makes innovators and creators a co-owner with the original owner of the owner's property. And this is just theft. It's the redistribution of wealth. It's really that simple. This is the problem with patent and copyright. So, for example, a patentee acquires partial ownership uh, rights in other people's property. But he did not homestead the property. He has no contract with the owner. And the owner has never committed any kind of tort or crime that justifies weakening his property rights or redistributing them to the, uh, to the patentee. Now, the question arises, how could libertarians who favor property rights um, and other advocates of capitalism and the free market, how could they have been bamboozled into thinking that an anti-competitive monopolistic grant of state privilege uh, by a criminal state be justified? So let's just take a quick look at the history of the sordid origins of patent and copyright. As uh, Eric Johnson, a law professor, writes in an upcoming study, the monopolies now understood as copyrights and patents were originally created by royal decree bestowed as a form of favoritism and control. As the power of the monarchy dwindled, these chartered monopolies were reformed, and essentially by default, they wound up in the hands of authors and inventors. So let's think about copyright. Copyright, uh, in a modern sense, originated when Queen Mary created the Stationers Company in 1557, which had the exclusive franchise over book publishing. So this was based upon the monarchy's desire to control the press and to control this uh, the use of, of the printing press, which was emerging, uh, and to censor ideas and to have only approved ideas spread. In 1710, the Statute of Anne uh, formalized this idea of copyright and gave authors a copyright. And one reason authors were happy to have this copyright was now they had the right to control their own works. So in a way, the, the reason that they approved and wanted copyright was to remove uh, the state's control over their own works. It wasn't to be able to extort money from uh, people using their works. As for patent, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the English Parliament enacted the Statute of Monopolies in 1624, and this was aimed at stopping the grants of letters patent by the Parliament uh, by the Crown, which uh, was being uh, uh, notorious, notoriously misused. Even it was used to authorize Sir Francis Drake to be a, an actual pirate uh, on the seas in 1587. Uh, but there was a carve out for. Uh, in, in, Letters patent were generally banned in the Statute of Monopolies, except there was a carve-out for, for novel inventions. So this is the origins of patent and copyright. So it ends up being included in the American Constitution in the Patent and Copyright Clause in 1789. Um, nowadays, some people say that it's a natural right to have patent and copyright. It was never regarded as this. It was, it was done for purely utilitarian purposes to induce innovation and invention and creativity. Um, uh, John Locke was mildly in favor of patent and copyright, but never thought his homesteading theory covered it. The founding fathers did also did not believe patent and copyright were natural rights. It was put in there purely for prudential reasons to encourage innovation. So basically, it was based upon some assumption at the time that it's necessary or that it generates uh, it's necessary to generate wealth and creativity. The problem is studies since then have not been able to verify this utilitarian assumption. Uh, in 1958, Fritz Machlub, a quasi-Austrian economist, uh, was commissioned by Congress to write a study on the IP system. It's one of the, anyone who's interested in this field should really read his study. Um, he wrote in 1958 in a study to Congress, no economist on the basis of present knowledge could possibly state with certainty that the patent system as it now operates confers a net benefit or a net loss upon society. The best he can do is state assumptions and make guesses about the extent to which the reality corresponds to these assumptions. If we did not have a patent system, it would be irresponsible on the basis of our present knowledge of, of its economic consequences to recommend instituting one. And I have done an estimate myself because you'll find that the advocates of intellectual property who claim that this system is justified because it generates net wealth in the form of extra innovation, uh, they never bother to even attempt to try to figure out 
what's, what these numbers are. So I've done it myself, and I've come up with a conservative estimate that the patent system in America alone, just the patent system, uh, imposes a net loss on the economy of at least $42 billion. That's a complete net loss. And it probably uh, reduces innovation at, on the net uh, in, the, in the bargain. So we lose money to have worse innovation. The point is the burden is on proponents of the IP system to justify it. Um, they need to tell us what is the cost of the patent system? What is the value of the extra innovation that it allegedly induces? What's the cost of the innovation that it suppresses? And what's the net number? I'd like to know. And in my view, because of these empirical facts, uh, IP is arguably unconstitutional because the copyright and patent clause uh, states that the purpose of this, the, the grant of, of this power to Congress is to promote the progress of the science and the arts. But there's no showing that it actually does promote the progress of science and the arts. So what happens is in the meantime, this idea of intellectual property becomes part of the fabric of Western capitalism. It starts being called a property right. This was done intentionally. As Maclop says, those who started using the word property in connection with inventions had a very definite purpose in mind. They wanted to substitute a word with a respectable connotation, property, for a word that had an unpleasant ring, privileges. So basically, intellectual propaganda, as I call it, has been used to cover up the monopolistic character of these grants. So now you have people saying, uh, well, IP is a natural right, that just, even though its original purpose was uh, monopoly, censorship, and control, um, and then a utilitarian ground. Or they'll say it's justified on empirical grounds, but they never give any evidence for this. In a way, it's similar to the minimum wage, which economists uh, routinely and universally regard as being um, uh, harmful to the economy, and yet it's hard to kill politically. It's very similar with regard to intellectual property. Economists are pretty uh, uniform in their view that uh, there's no proof that a patent system uh, is worth it. Uh, but what happens is, because it's in the Constitution and part of the American system, libertarians and propertarians and others who favor the free market, now they've sort of bought into this mentality that, well, it's a property right, we're in favor of property rights. So, and you know, after all, it's in the Constitution, right? Uh, well, I, I'm not so sure that being in the Constitution is a good endorsement. The Constitution was nothing but a centralizing, power-grabbing coup. Uh, the Constitution also permitted or condoned slavery, paper money, and inflation of the business cycle, judicial supremacy, taxation, tariffs, capital punishment, conscription, war, corruption, domination, drug prohibition, mass murder, war crimes, torture of Guantanamo, Waco, Ruby Ridge, the evil Abraham Lincoln, suspension of habeas corpus, imperialism, eminent domain, state-enforced bigotry, racism, and misogyny. Um, as Lysander Spooner, the famous anarchist, said, the Constitution has either authorized such a government as we have had or it has been powerless to prevent it. In either case, it is unfit to exist. In my view, the Constitution is utterly unlibertarian, and we libertarians have to wake up and stop worshiping the Constitution as quasi-libertarian and the early America as proto-libertarian. They weren't. As Ayn Rand might say, wishing doesn't make it so. And speaking of Ayn Rand, one reason I believe for the strong uh, pro-IP uh, view among libertarians until the present day was her influence. So, she was part of the movement to help start and describe patent and copyright as property rights. She even said, ridiculously, patents are the heart and core of property rights. And some of her modern um, um, acolytes uh, say things like, all property rights are, all property rights are intellectual property rights. Uh, by the way, Ayn Rand actually initially favored eminent domain because it was in the Constitution. But then she changed her mind later when she thought about it. So she had this Constitution fetish in worship because it was better than the Russia she came from. Um, but the, the point is, despite the propaganda about classifying patent and copyright as property rights, there's still artificial state monopolies. The goal of the law and, is justice and property rights, not tweaking incentives by the state to produce innovation or to maximize wealth. The purpose of property rights is to fairly assign owners to scarce resources so they can use, maybe use peacefully and productively instead of being fought over. The purpose of property rights is to reduce conflict. And as I mentioned in the beginning, Human action uses scarce means to achieve ends, but it's guided by ideas. So the role of information and ideas is different than the role of scarce resources and means in human action. So take, imagine the idea of making a cake. To, to make a cake, you need a recipe, but you also need scarce resources, ingredients, a bowl, an oven, your body. Um, 
you and your neighbor can both make the same type of cake at the same time as long as you have property rights in your own resources, but you can use the same recipe. This is exactly why there are property rights in scarce resources, but not in non-scarce resources like ideas. And if you think about it this way, pat patent and copyright are always ultimately enforced against scarce resources, money or body. So for example, if I assert my patent right against you, I take you to court, I get the state court to issue state force against you to force you to cough up some money from your bank account or to force you to physically stop under threat of an injunction using your body in a certain way. So it always comes down to control of scarce resources. And these patent and copyright laws serve as nothing but an excuse to assign resources from one person to another. They are merely disguised transfers of wealth from owners to innovators and others who receive a state privilege that pr pr protects them from competition. So the problem with IP is that it undermines legitimate property rights. So the reason propertarians like me are anti-IP is for the same reason we're against taxes and redistribution of wealth in the first place. One more way to think about it is this. How much time do I have, Amon? Okay. Um, one more way to think about it is this. The free market, we, we live in a world of scarcity. You can't say that's a bad thing because it's natural, but it certainly is a challenge to living. We all have to find resources that are efficacious and to satisfy our needs, food, shelter, tools. Um, and with a free market where property rights are respected and competition is possible, by the way, competition requires emulation, seeing what someone's doing and emulating it or doing better or learning from the body of human knowledge. Um, when, this is, when this is possible, the free market generates amazing prosperity in the face of scarcity. So you can think of scarcity as the enemy that the free market is trying to overcome and does a good job of overcoming it. And yet, we already have non-scarcity in ideas. The body of human knowledge grows over time. This is what makes progress possible. We can always dip into the body of human knowledge and add to it and learn of new alternatives, things we can do. Uh, for example, I may know um, of two types of pie, chocolate pie and lemon pie. So I choose one of those as my favorite. And then I may know of two ways to achieve that pie. Uh, I can cook it, I can hire someone, or I can buy it, or I can steal it. Um, well, if I, if I learn more information, I might learn of a coconut pie. Now my universe of ends has been expanded. Or I might learn of another technique, to make, another technique to make the pie. Maybe I buy a frozen pie. So my universe of means is expanded. So the more knowledge we have, the richer is our universe of information that we can use to guide our actions. So it's a good thing that the body of human knowledge is always expanding. Learning is a good thing. Emulation is a good thing. Competition is a good thing. And these ideas are already luckily non-scarce and infinitely reusable, transmittable, learnable. And to impose artificial scarcity on this in the name of a free market, in the name of property rights, which operates to fight scarcity in the physical realm, is suicidal and absurd and, uh, frankly, uh, obscene. And I will stop here. Good afternoon. Um, I guess I'm going to go back and hit a lot of the same areas that uh, Mr. Kinsella was telling us about because one of the principal bases that our country has been around for 225 years now, 35 years, I guess, is the constitutional system. And although I think we all can admit that the Constitution may not have been written exactly the way everybody would have wanted it to be today, when it was written, we've been able to accommodate that. We've been able to make changes. And the important thing that we have in the United States is we do have a constitutional authorization to Congress and let me read you the words of Article uh, 1, or yeah, Article 1, Clause 8, Section 8 says, it says that to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing four limited times, and that's the important word, four limited times, 
to authors and inventors. And those are really important words, too. The exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Now, an author or an inventor has given us something that we didn't have before. Okay? They've taken goods or they've taken a view of the world and they've put it through their mind and something has come out that did not exist before. Okay? To give you a few examples, certainly we would all agree that if I were to build a table, I would have the right to sell the table to someone who wants to buy it. Okay? But are we going to deny during the time of the copyright Melville's right to the, to the character of Captain Ahab in the story of Moby Dick, a story that didn't exist before he put it down on paper? Would we deny Harper Lee the story to kill a mockingbird? Are we going to say that that book never had an influence on anybody? and that she should have put it into the public domain and let everybody take the story, print copies of it without having to pay her. Uh, you know, we would we do that. And in the area of patents, would we say that we're not going to give some sort of compensation to the inventor of penicillin? And the number of lives that were saved after and the sun was introduced because of the people that died previously because there wasn't a good antibiotic. Um, I heard a lot of good things and some things I, I agree with from Mr. Kinsella, but one of the things that I have to point out to you is that in the world today, okay, we have a convention, an international convention called the Berne Convention, which to be truthful with you, the United States was a renegade for many years, did not join. They only joined about 20 years ago, <coughs> over 20 years ago. But we have in the United States, or in the world today, we have 164 countries that are parties to the Berne Convention. In other words, they have copyright systems. We have in the World Intellectual Property Organization, and the ability to get to get priority on your patent applications by filing in your home country. We've got like 184 countries. Um, I don't know of any developed country in the world that does not have a copyright and or patent system. I mean, they have them both. Um, I don't think that anybody would want to um, be the first one to jettison their system. One of the things that has happened, and I certainly can agree with Professor, with Mr. Kinsella, that we need to maybe make some changes in the very specific language that we have. One of them being, one of the problems that we all see with our copyright system, for example, is that the term of copyright is much, much longer than it is than is the term of a patent. Originally in the United States, they were about the same. However, it almost becomes a joke when I end up saying to people like I did last semester in my copyright class here, if I was a lobbyist for a drug company, I would be going down to Congress and suggesting they should be giving me 90-year patents for my drugs. Um, the important thing is the way we encourage innovation is to make people innovate. To basically put something out there and give you a right and a limited time to exploit it. And at the end of that, and this is where the limited times comes in, our system requires that at the end of the patent term, that invention belongs to the public. Okay? There's no way you can renew that patent forever. There's no way that you can renew that copyright forever. At some point in time, the contribution, the novel contribution 
is going to belong to all of us. And what we need to do is to encourage that. I'm not necessarily the biggest supporter of President Obama, but one of the things I hope you heard in his State of the Union address is the need to get American innovation started and to get it going. That is where we have moved ahead of many other developing countries from when we were a developing country. Um, one of the things we can see today in China is a very strong effort in that country to encourage innovation and to their patent system has made tremendous strides in the last 20 years. And so I think that we need to have intellectual property protection. And it is not, as you might have had suggested to you, a system that the government is involved in. There is no copyright police, or there shouldn't be. There isn't a patent police. But if somebody takes something out of my pocket, I should have the opportunity to go to court and to stop taking what is mine. And that's what our patent system provides. It provides a civil remedy to people. And one of the things that's really important with the intellectual property system, and this becomes real important when you deal with the client. If somebody trespasses on my real property, and I go to court and I sue them for trespass, chances are extremely good that when I walk out of that court, whether I win the trespass suit or not, I will still own my house. But that's not true in the intellectual property community. Because if I go to court and I say that somebody is infringing my patent, just as much as that court has the right <coughs> to enjoin the other party from stopping me or from, from their infringing, the court also has the ability to determine that if the patent office was wrong in giving me a patent because my invention is not useful or not novel or is obvious, I may well leave that court without a patent. I will walk in with property and will walk out having had it taken away from me. And that is valuable part of the system. I think that American progress and progress around a lot of the world is attributable to the patent and copyright systems. And I think that we need to keep it in place. Is it totally perfect? No. Is it better though? Is, would it, is it better to have it than to abolish it? Yes. Um, most of the uh, top 10 wonder drugs of the last century 
Um, we, we're not patented at all. It has nothing to do with patents. Um, and uh, he shows that almost all the common assumptions, empirically speaking, about pharmaceuticals are just completely false. Um, as for being the first country not to have a patent system, well, I mean, the patent system is relatively new. It's about 200 years old. So countries uh, had innovation before then, and we had artistic creation before the copyright law. Um, the ne Netherlands and the Switzerlands had a 50-year, 70-year period in the 1800s when they had no patent protection, and innovation thrived and increased. There's a recent story out about how Germany had almost no copyright protection for a period of time in the 1800s, and during that period of time, uh, the publishing industry thrived uh, orders of magnitude more than the more controlled system in Britain. So if you want to talk empirical studies, there's lots of reason to believe that it's just simply not necessary. Um, and I would like to know what is the proof that the benefit, I mean, we all can admit that there's a cost to the patent system and the copyright system. It clearly imposes costs on society. The question is, what's the net benefit that results, and is it greater than this cost? I'd like to know how we know that the system is worth it. Um, as for promoting innovation, it's not the job of the state to promote innovation. The state does a terrible thing in everything it does except kill, destroy, and propagandize. It does a bad job in everything else. Um, the what, if you want to improve innovation, you know what causes innovation? Strong system of property rights and wealth. And this is what the state ruins and undermines every day. Taxes over half of our wealth, ruins another half, another half of that half with the cost of regulations, causes the business cycle with inflation, uh, imposes crazy regulations on companies with the FDA, pro-union legislation, minimum wage laws, environmental regulations. Basically, it is doing everything it can to kill private enterprise and the free market. So if you want to promote innovation, get the state out of the way. Have it reduce the tax rate. Have it reduce the regulations. Don't go to this criminal uh, penalizing monster that is hurting our lives and our economy, putting people in jail for, for smoking marijuana, killing people in Iraq. Don't trust this thing that is destroying our economy to add a monopoly right on top of it for people to make up a little bit for the, for the harm it's doing to the economy in the first place. So if you want to, um, uh, if you want to promote innovation, reduce the size of the state drastically or eliminate it. Um, if, one final comment, as for there being no copyright police, well, there was about 100 domain seizures uh, a couple of weeks ago by ICE, this, uh, this fascist organization uh, of the federal government, uh, largely on copyright grounds. So uh, there is a copyright police out there, and uh, it's a big problem. Thank you. Monopoly um, and the copyright police. And, and uh, let me start with that last one. Now, I'm not familiar with the ICE situation, but in general, and, and certainly on the patent side of things, there is no criminal procedure in place. And to the extent that there is in copyright, uh, as I said, I think the, the overall system is good at the edges, it has things that are wrong, and in fact, the criminal infringement notice that you see at the beginning of a movie when you run a movie from Blockbuster or Netflix or one of these places, um, I would like to see that go away too. I mean, again, it's, it's a, it should be a civil issue. It's a personal property type issue. It should be settled between people. Taxes. Um, I don't know that we impose any taxes on you for the copyright patent systems in the United States. And in fact, my clients that go to the patent office pay a considerable amount of money to convince an examiner who is representing and watching an ex parte proceeding between me and the examiner. And that examiner is taking into account the rights of the American people. We don't want to give a patent to somebody and 
take away an ability they have to do something right now. We don't want to give a patent and stop them from doing something that is in their public domain rights right now. But again, it's you know, sort out those situations. And on the word monopoly, um, you know, the Constitution talks about an exclusive right, meaning the right to exclude. And in fact, it's been probably since the late 1930s when the courts have stopped talking about monopolies with regard to patents. But the real economic finding has been in recent years in court holdings is that in most cases, a patent holder does not really have a monopoly power. Okay, we don't get involved in antitrust issues in most situations because there are enough non-infringing alternatives out there. And in fact, one of the benefits of our system is that <coughs> in getting the patent, I have disclosed to you how I do what I do. And I've limited it to a set of claims. And it is up to you if you can design around that and move the progress on, you're perfectly free to do it. So I don't see that we've got a problem. And as I said, I certainly don't see any country that has succeeded without having these protections. As for Germany in the 1800s and having a very thriving publishing industry, that's probably correct because they could publish books that they didn't have to pay royalties to people. Again, we had problems in the United States in that same time period. We did not readily give copyright protection to authors from England, for example. And I cite England because those people were writing in the English language. What publishers in the United States were doing was they were printing to the exclusion of American authors, they were printing works by British authors because they didn't have to pay a royalty. And although we had Henry Clay gave a famous speech in the Senate talking about how Walter Scott, Sir Walter Scott, was almost penniless in Scotland because his books were being ripped off by American publishers, one of his big arguments <coughs> is we have American authors who are not getting their work out because a publisher won't publish them because they would have to pay a royalty. They're going out and they're, they're giving preference to the person they can publish for free. So I think that we have some distinct differences and we need to keep the system in place. Fix it, but keep it. I wasn't really using that as an argument, uh, my personal argument for a positive argument to abolish copyright. I was sort of just rebutting the, the, the comment by Mr. Grant that um, uh, no countries had tried this before. I mean, and just to show that there are counterexamples, that there are cases. Uh, this is a, a pretty f a famous study that came out, I think, six months ago. Uh, if you search, just search for German publishing or something like that on c4sf.org, you'll find the, the, the original newspaper article. Uh, and, and the study, and it goes into detail about how it worked. But I think basically what happened was it actually was not um, uh, German publishers publishing um, uh, works from other countries. I mean, it was authors writing a lot of books, and they did it to make a profit or to create, the, to express themselves. I mean, you can sell a book even though you don't have a copyright in it. It's possible to do it. You just sell it. I mean, this happens even right now. 
uh, a lot of, I mean, the Mises Institute, where I uh, do a lot of work, has, in part because of the IP ideas, opened up everything free. They publish everything Creative Commons attribution only, not even a non-commercial thing. And, and they say, take it, do whatever you want with it. And they get, put free PDFs and EPUB versions online. And, they, and, and their, their bookstore sales have tripled or quadrupled in the last two years. People read these books, they learn about them, uh, and they want to buy the physical copy sometimes. Or they donate more to the Mises too. So I think the, the incentive is to sell books for profit. Just because there's competition doesn't mean it's impossible. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Yeah. Yes. And if so, like, how would you like not put it in there so that there's no business broker you should like just copy somebody else's background and then you know, I created it independently? Well, copyright law has a, a, a similar feature already because um, if you if you happen to have independent creation, then you're not actually copying. So you, you could have now the theory, it almost never happens. Um, <coughs> but um, it, it sometimes happens in software. In, in software, there's an approach called the clean room approach. So what they'll do is they will intentionally develop, it's not the Intel kind of clean room with the guys dancing around in the, in the, in the suits. It's, um, it just means they set up an environment like a Chinese wall type thing where you can have proof from your procedures that these in engineers had no access to the software code of, of a competitor so that if there's a similarity, it had to have been an independent creation. So if you added this, I mean, it's a, I, if you think about it, it's a travesty that the patent law doesn't have this because uh, most people don't, aren't aware of this. Um, and I'd be curious if, if Professor Grant would be in favor of such a, um, such a, uh, a change to the patent law. Uh, you, you can even be the first inventor and still be stopped. Okay? So let's say I, I, I have a, a chemical process where I'm a, a, a mixing process to make a chemical. It's a novel process or a novel nozzle or something like that. And I keep it secret for 30 years. It's a trade secret. Someone else independently invents it. They file a patent and they can sue me and actually stop me from using my own invention. This is true. Am I wrong? Well, um, I would generally agree with what you're saying, except that what I would point out there is that the standard in copyright is originality. And so to the extent that you independently create, you've met the originality requirement. The requirement in patent law is novelty. And if the invention is known or used by others in this country, for example, for more than a year before you applied for your patent, um, that person would not be entitled to a patent. The, what would probably happen if you've been using that process for 30 years and you get sued, you're probably going to have a very good excuse because you're going to show that if others knew the process and you used it for that long, then the invention is in the public domain. Likewise, uh, the inventor who invents and keeps it to himself hasn't undertaken the, uh, the step that we ask for. To get a patent, you have to give us something. You teach us something we didn't know how to do before. Okay, okay so, but if the... It, if you're selling a product and the idea is embodied in the product, then you're right. It would serve as a, as a, as a prior art, a statutory bar. But if it's in the case I gave, if it's secret, and if you're selling just a regular chemical that has no novelty in it, but it's just made by, say, this process, which is trade secret, it would not serve as a statutory bar. Um, and you could be stopped, even if it's 30 years later. Um, furthermore, if you independently invent something at the same time or later, uh, but it's, you haven't filed a patent for it, you can also be stopped there. So it seems to be only fair that there should be an exception. Now, someone asked about how you could prove this. Well, right now in the patent system, you have to be the inventor. It, it has to be novel. The invention has to be novel and non-obvious. But it also has to be your invention, which means you are the inventor. So that's a statutory requirement. And so when you file a patent application, you have to swear under oath that you are the inventor, which means you didn't learn about it from someone else. Okay? So... If you had this defense, then the, the person who was using the defense could just make the same kind of proof. He would have to prove that he was the an inventor of it on his own as well. It would just be the same kind of standard of proof being used. Um, I want to make one comment about the um, uh, uh, Professor Grant is correct that one of the uh, stated purposes of the patent system is to encourage disclosure. 
And so that's the bargain, we call it, right? You, in other words, to get a patent monopoly from the state. And I realize it doesn't make you a, a monopolist always in the, in the antitrust sense, although there is always a tension between antitrust law and patent law. But it is a monopoly grant that allows you to charge a, monopoly, a monopolistic price. That's the whole purpose is to let you charge a greater price because you can squelch competition. Um, but you're right that one alleged benefit is that we get this disclosure of ideas. The, the problem is most of these things are ideas that would have been disclosed anyway because they'd be embodied the product. And companies are going to keep some things trade secret still that they don't want to file a patent for. So we're going to get disclosure of things that largely would have been disclosed anyway. And furthermore, the other pernicious Im impact of this is the patent system is very expensive and complicated. And a lot of smaller companies and individuals cannot afford to file a patent application or they don't want to. So they're at risk of being shut down, as I mentioned, because they, if they were the first inventor. So what they do is they, they engage in defensive patent publishing. So they do – they publish an article like in a journal. They have to pay $100 or something like this. There's websites that do this. And they actually disclose their idea intentionally to set up a statutory bar so no one else can patent it later. So you have these poor people who – are not trying to get a monopoly. They just want to practice their own invention, and yet they're forced to reveal what they otherwise would have the right to keep as a trade secret in a, in a free society uh, just to defend themselves from a, pa a potential patent suit. So the disclosure that the patent system encourages is not from the inventors who f get the patents because they're largely disclosing what they would have had to disclose anyway to, to market the product. Um, but it's causing potential victims of the patent system to disclose what they should have had the right to keep secret if they wanted to. Other questions? Yes. Um, I, I have a. You said that uh, that removing intellectual property monopoly would increase uh, the economy and would increase innovation and so on. And since this was couched as what we're doing now, I, I like it. I personally can't see how a software company like Adobe or Microsoft or one of those could effectively make software. Okay, so let, let me address those, uh, those points. Um, I mean, I'm not making the positive claim that there would be more innovation if you get rid of patent and copyright, although I think there would be. But, but my point is that the other case has not been proven, um, and I think it, it looks likely that, that, that the current system imposes a cost, an overall net cost of at least $42 billion on society. Uh, if you remove that cost alone, then you make people wealthier. They have more money to engage in innovation by itself. My point was that if we want to improve innovation, we have to get rid of other government costs. So that I wasn't saying the copyright system is a tax, although it is a tax. What I was talking about was regular taxes. When the government takes 50 percent of the consumer's wealth and taxes corporations and imposes all these costs, they basically reduce the amount of wealth that we have to, to use to engage in innovation and hire employees and things like that. So we would improve innovation by lowering the tax rate, for example, or in other government innovations. That was another point. Um, now, when you ask, basically, you, you say, and I don't want to, I'm not, not trying to be cute here, but you say you don't see how X, Y, and Z would happen. I mean, a question or a confusion is not an argument, right? I mean, it's okay that you have a confusion or a question, but that's not an argument for an IP system just because you don't see how X, Y, and Z would, ha would happen. Uh, now, there are, there are reasonable uh, uh, suppositions or ideas about how the, the free society would operate. But, you know, if you asked a, a, a denizen of Russia and a Soviet Union in 1982, um, uh, you told them we're going to abolish this, the, the state monopoly over making toothpaste, they might freak out and say, well, my God, who's going to make the toothpaste? And, and if we have a free market in toothpaste, how many flavors would there be and, and how would I choose? I mean, and, and it wouldn't be fair to put the burden of proof on the person advocating dismantling the oppressive state and the monopolistic communist system to – do I have to – extrapolate and prove exactly what the new free market is going to look like when we get rid of the state. The state has ruined things by distorting everything. It's, it's hard to tell, but I think we have some indications. You would have software made for profit, and just like we have now in the, in, the, in the open source movement. I mean, this goes on all the time. What you have right now is you have all these uh, uh, interoperability problems between um, uh, technologies and standards precisely because, um, as Professor Grant said, when you're aware of a patent or a copyright of someone else, 
you have to navigate around it or design around it. So you have companies putting crazy, uh, 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 coming up with different interlocking standards, different connectors. So you have all these standards that don't mesh together right now. So that's a lot of societal waste right there. Um, I think you could expect to see a lot more uniformity and inter inter interoperability and compatibility. Um, but in any case, uh, you know, you can imagine any number of ways that you could have software being generated. Uh, look, it, it's hard to argue that you would have no. I, I don't know anyone who would seriously argue that in a copyright and patent-free world you would have no innovation at all. You can't say there would be no innovation. You can't say there would be no software. You cannot say there would be no artistic creativity, novels, uh, movies, etc. The only argument you can have is that there would be less. But then, how much less would there be? And how do you know that? I mean, uh, how do you know that we have enough right now? In fact, there are some even libertarians who, who say that well, the monopoly provided by copyright and patent is not enough extra incentive. We still have a we, a shortage of, of innovation, so we have to have an eighty billion dollar uh, tax funded medical prize award that a panel of government and industrial corporatist experts every year uses to hand out to, uh, to uh, well-deserving recipients, sort of a government Nobel Prize. So there's no end to this. I mean, we could tax, we could have a trillion dollars in the pot. We could increase the penalties to uh, capital punishment and a million years of copyright term. I mean, where's the end of this? So basically, it's a utilitarian idea that keeps piling on government controls to try to have a little bit more innovation stimulated when you don't even know how much it stimulates. And there's, like I say, there's no proof that, um, that the copyright and patent system actually increases overall societal wealth. Uh, on, the, on that question, I'd just like to point out that uh, it's too bad we don't have a transcript here. Um, Mr. Kinsella just told us in the same answer that we need to get rid of the state but we also need more standards so things have interoper better interoperability um, than the free market. <coughs> yes, Jim. Yeah, um, so can I believe the positive or negative impact of an IP regime seems difficult, and I think you know there's a difficulty in the fact that um, you didn't know of anyone else who really calculated that number except, I think, for yourself. Um, I was wondering how you came up with that $42 billion negative economic impact number and whether or not you took into account all the, the major pharmaceutical, biotech, and consumer product companies that rely on patents to drive their innovation, that brings their products, that brings their profit, and creates jobs for millions of Americans. Um, there's a um, – it was, it was a – Back of the envelope calculation. I mean, I, I tried as best I could using data I could find, and I've got a blog post on it where I went through my numbers. It's if you search on my, uh, I think it's on my personal blog or it's on the Mises blog. I think it's called "Revisiting the Cost of the Patent System," something like that. And um, uh, I, I, I estimated using some studies I'd found how much the cost of litigation is, other things like this. Um, and then, so I came up with 31 billion actually as a net with my first number. And then about a year later, an actual study came out, a really detailed study about the cost of patent litigation itself. And this was based upon empirical studies of the number of suits filed, how much lawyers are paid. And they concluded $31 billion was the cost of patent litigation. Now, in my calculations, I had assumed $20 billion, So I was within an order of magnitude, but I was off. So they actually had $11 billion more. That's why I added 11 to my 31 to make it 42. Um, but yeah, I try to take into account everything I can. And I honestly think that's a, that's a conservative number. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it's $100 billion. Yes, sir. Follow. Well, so, I mean, the pharmaceutical industry itself spends more than that in billions of dollars a year in research and development for new drugs. Now, without patents, they couldn't make back that investment uh, for in the first place. So I, I don't understand how you can't take into account those numbers when you're arguing that this IP regime has a <coughs> well, $2 billion economic impact. Well, I, I, I would just direct you to Seriously, read the chapter. It's a short chapter. Well, it's not a short chapter, but it's a good chapter in Bolger and Levine's book. It's, it's exactly on the pharmaceutical industry, and they're economists and they're empiricists. I'm not. Uh, they go through this in detail, and it's really eye-opening. They just explode almost every single myth out there with hard numbers. Uh, and they started writing their book um, to defend IP, and then they discovered all the evidence was the other way. So they became ardent IP opponents. So I would take a look at that chapter, and I, I think you'll see that there's really no support for these claims – now, you say they couldn't sell it. They couldn't make a profit. That's just an assumption. That's just an assertion. I mean, as a simple example, we all go down to the drugstore right now, and you see Tylenol, 
next to the generic acetaminophen, and it's about twice as expensive. Some people buy the generic, some people buy Tylenol. Why is that? They pay twice as much for Tylenol still. I mean, if your argument was correct, then there would be no way Tylenol could make a profit off of their, their drug, or they'd have to cut their costs down all the way down to the generic price. In other words, they face competition, and they, they, they have a reputation. People. Tylenol isn't looking to pay a billion dollars worth of research and development to that product anymore. And that's why there's such a fight between pharmaceutical companies and generic companies when generics try to come on the scene and validate their patents because they can't make back that money. There really is no way that they put this much money into developing new drugs. So the option seems to either be provide patents so that these new drugs, life-saving medicine for cancer, AIDS, um, high cholesterol, blood medicine can be developed, or that innovation would dry up a little bit only to the level that they're able to recoup that money for without those patents, like Tylenol, however much money is needed to market Tylenol. That's all they could spend in research and development. I, I mean, I, I think a lot of your assertions are just based upon, they're just false. I mean, I, I would just direct you to also, um, today or yesterday, on the Mises blog, Hubert, who's here, um, my friend Jacob Hubert, his article, or his chapter from his book on libertarianism today, his chapter on intellectual property came out, and he's actually got a, a, a short summary of that Bolger and Levine chapter and a list of all these wonder drugs that came about that had nothing to do with, uh, with patent protection. So I think if you actually see the facts, you will see that a lot of the assumptions – I mean I think you're repeating the sort of common wisdom, and of course the pharmaceutical companies want protection from competition. One reason they want it is because they're hampered by the FDA process, and they're, they're harmed by taxes and regulations. So they're hoping to make it up a little bit that way. Other questions? Yes. Well, my solution is to have a free market and respect property rights and get the state out of the way and reduce taxes. Right. How, how do you translate that into the specific, say, small ecosystem of drugs? I mean, okay, get your taxes on for part. Okay, so you have to pay the FDA and say that? Well, I'm an anarchist. I think the state should be abolished, of course. And even if we don't do that, I think we should have a minimal government like we had allegedly in the beginning of the country. And um, I think the FDA is completely unconstitutional, as, as is uh, the DMCA aspect of copyright, as is the federal Lanham Act trademark law. They're, all, they're completely unconstitutional because they're not authorizing the Constitution. And this, this, this idea that the Interstate Commerce Clause justifies it as a general police power is, is absurd and ridiculous. So how do you expect to like, police the safety and efficacy of drugs? I mean, do you think that should be back to the court system? Uh, yes. Yes, it should be. Um, I, I, I just think about it this way. Approach it like this. I mean, I've had 10, 15 years to think about this hard, so this may seem um, uh, uh, shocking and radical. But just think about it this way. If you're going to propose the use of the state apparatus to establish this big bureaucratic legislated system, which clearly is a, causes some problems, if you're going to uh, come up with an argument like you just did about the pharmaceutical industry – I mean, your argument is not good enough. It's just, a, it's just a short, you know, if, 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 you know, or it seems to me. I mean, you really need to have the burden of proof. I mean, if you want to argue that these patents are necessary, then you need to come up with some numbers and prove it. And I'm, I mean, from what I've seen, the, the, if you actually look at it hard like Bolger and Levine did, you will actually see that all the assumptions are wrong. It's just wrong. Now, if you start asking, well, then how are they going to do this? I mean, you know, it's not the job of a political economist to tell you how to run your business and how to make a profit. You have to figure it out. This is the cost. This is what every entrepreneur faces. They face the fact that they need to have costs of exclusion, right? A, a movie, uh, uh, a drive-in movie theater, uh, 
if, if they have people that can watch the movie for free and listen to it for free because they have loudspeakers and the screens outside, I mean, they could go lobby Congress for some kind of, of right to, uh, to uh, put people in jail that are watching it for free, uh, or they can just uh, uh, put speakers in for each car like they did, you know? But even a regular business, you have to have locks on the doors, you have to have security guards, you have to have um, uh, a receptionist at the, at the movie, you have to have someone that takes the ticket. Because if you don't, people will just go in and watch it for free. So you have to envision a, a, a business and try to imagine if you can make a profit with some reasonable or maybe creative cost of exclusion. And sometimes it's a challenge. Sometimes you might have to bundle your intangible or your immaterial services that are hard to keep from being leaked out, bundle it with something else, reputation, um, um, provision of some kind of services, something like that. That's the entrepreneur's job, not mine. And the, the problem with this tweaking idea, I mean, there's no stopping point. I mean, basically, the argument is that without patents, we have X drugs, and that's not enough. We could have X plus, X plus Y if we have a patent system. Okay, so now we have X plus Y, allegedly, although I think it's X minus Y. But we have X plus Y now. Well, why is X plus Y enough? We could have X plus Y plus Z if we just strengthen the protections a little bit more. Or if we have this bonus system like I'm talking about. I mean, it's only $80 billion. Maybe we get $300 billion of benefit out of having this $80 billion prize. I, mean, I don't know. If, if, your, if your mindset is empirical and utilitarian, there's no reason to, to not propose that too. Well, why not a trillion? Maybe we get two trillion of benefit out of that one trillion. I mean, where's the stopping point? It's a completely unprincipled position, and the way to make it principled is to stop making, it seems to me, arguments and thinking that they're conclusive. I mean, if you're serious, you have to make a real argument and get the data. Yeah, yeah, I've, 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 I've commented on that before. What's, I mean, it's, it's, it shows the, uh, the complete economic illiteracy of Gene Roddenberry and these guys in, in, in Hollywood. I mean, money is one of the best inventions of all time. Um, uh, money is going to always be necessary for, e for rational economic calculation to occur. Uh, and we will never reach a post-scarcity society um, because we live in a world of scarce things. We'll always have scarcity in terms of – scarcity doesn't mean lack of abundance. Scarcity in this technical economic sense means a particular object can only be used by one person at a time. Use by me excludes your ability to use it. So even if we had infinite bananas everywhere, if I pick one, you know, this is a scarce banana. And the only way you can use it is to take it from me. We can't both use it at the same time. Now, in such a world, you almost have a, a lack of abundance type scarcity uh, merging with the – economic idea of scarcity because in a world where there was infinite bananas and infinite food and everything, even if each particular one's scarce, no one would really care if they took if no one would care if your banana was stolen because you could just get another. And in fact no one would steal it because they don't need to steal it. So um, in these sort of hypothetical scenarios, um, economics breaks down. Um, so I don't think we're ever going to reach a post scarce society. And it, it, to the extent we have scarcity at all, we have to have money <coughs> to rationally calculate economic activity. So I think Star Trek was just, uh, I'm not sure the connection to IP, but uh, <laughs> Star Trek was just absurd there. One final question. Yes. Uh, so pretty much without exception, all the countries with the largest and most rapidly increasing investment in research and development also have strong IP regimes. Correct. Well, I think what you just said is, is more like a research proposal. It's like it's, it's, um, it's observing sort of ad hoc some possible trends which would lead you to 
uh, study it more seriously if you wanted to really make that argument. I mean, I hear this argument all the time uh, from patent lawyers. They'll say, well, you know, America had a patent system since 1790, uh, and, and we've been a great country ever since then. But, well, we've also had taxation and antitrust and war about every 15 years in this country. So, I mean, do you want to argue that's the cause of our prosperity? Um, I think probably what happens, I mean, it could be, I, my personal view is the other way around. I mean, you're, you're confusing correlation with causation. I think that this idea of IP is entrenched, and people have been sold the idea that it's part of a capitalist property rights system. So when you start having a country start having stronger property rights, they, of course, increase their IP protection too because they think that's part of it. But the reason innovation is improving and increasing is because the country's getting richer because the property rights system is increasing at the same time. So that would be my guess is what you would find if you actually looked into the details um, closely. All right, if there are no further questions, please join me in a round of applause for speech today.